like to welcome each one of you today to the sermon series that we've been doing on how to build a strong church in the midst of this wicked, weak world that we live in. We have discussed the fact that every single church that does not consistently and constantly seek to be stronger by default will get weaker. And the exact th same thing that is true of a church is also true of the individual Christian. We must be continually strengthening ourselves in the things of God. I invite you to come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We've been looking at being stronger in biblical standards. And we've seen that everything rises and falls on leader leadership. And the simple truth of the matter is that standards is many times the first thing to go. It is the first thing that begins to weaken in the midst of a strong church. So if we want to be watching for weaknesses creeping in, what we need to be watching for is us getting lax in the area of biblical standards and of maintaining biblical standards in our lives, and more importantly, as we're looking at in this series, in our churches. So that's what we want to take some time to look at today as we conclude our study on biblical standards in this idea of having strong biblical standards. We want to look at what are some of the things that weaken discipline in our churches. What are some of the things that weaken biblical standards? So one of the first things we're going to be looking at, and I invite you to come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 7 it says this. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's bow in prayer. Father and God, we thank and we praise you, Lord God, today for who you are. Thank you for your goodness and grace in our lives. Lord, we pray that today that the God of heaven will help us as we open up your word as we desire to know what your word says about standards, Lord, may we not be drawn by the thoughts and the opinions of men, but may we base our understanding upon the word of God. Holy Spirit of God, open our eyes as we open the scriptures, open our understanding that we may understand the things that are written in your word. Lord God, we just thank and we praise you today for who you are in your name. Amen. So let me give you some of the things today that weaken discipline in our churches or weaken the maintenance of biblical standards. First and foremost, as we think about those things that weaken our standards in churches, it is the fear of man or pressure from man that will weaken the standards in our churches today. You know, one of the most difficult things for a preacher to enforce uh, as in light of God's word in the face of, of one's friends and relatives in the church is that idea of standards, what the Word of God teaches. So often, you know, we're human beings as preachers, we want to be liked and, and things of that nature. And, and we can, if we're not careful, we can get to the place in our lives that we will compromise on standards, that we will compromise on what the Word of God says for fear about what somebody will think of us or for fear of how someone will react if we maintain the standards of the Word of God. So because of the fact that many times people want to be liked, it's easy to get to the place that we don't enforce God's word the way that we ought to, that we don't enforce standards in the from the word of God the way that we ought to. And, and sometimes one of the dangers that's there is people will actually try to get close to the preacher. They'll draw close to the preacher, be close friends with the preacher, and flatter him with the goal of having him treat them with more leniency. Well, we know that this is a preacher that likes biblical standards and things of that nature. So maybe if I'm real good friends with him and I'm close with him, that he'll be a little bit more lenient with me than he will with other people. And, you know, sometimes this pressure that he feels from others to be lenient is a pressure that is real. Sometimes it's a pressure that's only perceived. It's not really there at all, but it... it we get to the place where we're wondering whether or not it's there, and we'll see some of the reasons for that in just a moment. And let me remind you that the devil is always trying to create fears where there is nothing to fear. The devil is always trying to get us to worry about things that, that when there's nothing to worry about. And then as we think about fear and the reason for standards not being enforced because of the fear of man or the pressure of man, uh, one of the one of the dangers in our churches today is relatives. The more relatives that there are in a church, the greater the danger. I'm referring here to the church members who are related to one another. 
You know, sometimes when you get into, into a church where there's a lot of people that are related to one another, if we're not careful, it's easy to get lenient when it comes to biblical standards. It's easy to get lenient when it comes to what the Word of God says because if we enforce biblical standards on somebody that is not living the way they ought to be living, we're not only running the risk of upsetting them, but we're running the risk of upsetting a lot of other people in the church because of the fact that we've offended one of their relatives. Friends, that just goes to show how soft of an age that we live in today that people would rather stand with family than stand with God. Friends, let me remind you that whether it's a, a person that we hardly know or whether it's a brother or a sister, a son, a daughter, a granddaughter or a grandson, a father or a mother, when they do something that is wrong, God's standards do not change based on who the person is. So, you know, when we're at a place, if our child does wrong, we ought to acknowledge that they've done wrong and we ought to desire that biblical standards would be maintained, whether it's our child, whether it's our brother, whether it's our sister, or whether it's somebody that we don't even know, God's standards have not changed and we are not helping them when we water down the standards that we have in order to accommodate them. Friends, it's not okay. If it's against the word of God, it's not the will of God. Don't try to ration things out. I don't know how many times I've seen people that have had firm biblical convictions on certain areas of their life, but all of a sudden, when their child does something, or their grandchild does something, or their brother does something, well, you know, preacher, I've prayed about this, and God's given me peace about it. Really? It's against God's word. God has clearly told us that he's against the in his word, but you're telling me that what they're doing is God's will? Oh, friends, let's not get lenient in the biblical standards that we have. And, and when somebody is involved in violating the word of God and the standards that God puts in his place, may we have the same attitude regardless of whether or not they are blood relatives or not. Now, as we're thinking about relatives, another danger that a preacher has is as he gets older and his children grow and he begins to have grandchildren in the church, the danger becomes even greater that he'll do one of two things. First of all, as that happens, the danger is there that he can get more lenient in his biblical standards if his family is not towing the line, if his family is, is not maintaining the standards that he has and that the church has and if they do not have the same convictions it's da the danger is there that the preacher will lighten up in order to be able to accommodate his family in order to get to the place that they are not offending or the other danger that is there in that scenario is sometimes a preacher can develop two sets of standards there will be one set of standards for his family and there will be another set of standards for somebody else Friends, what's wrong for one is wrong for all. And what's right for one is right for all. We can't change what the Word of God teaches or what our feelings are about something simply because somebody is related to us. Friends, the fear of man is something that must be faced by every preacher on a regular basis. Preachers constantly come to the place where they're challenged with the fear of man. They're challenged with wanting to make other people happy. They're, they're challenged with wanting to accommodate others. And friends, when it comes to this basis of, of, of the fear of man, it's not something that you get victory over once and for all. You can't look at it and say, oh, praise God, I've had victory over that in the past. That means I'm always going to have victory in that area. No, friends, that's not the way it works. Each case is a new test of whether or not the preacher will fear God or fear man, whether he's more concerned with, with impressing God or impressing man, whether he's more concerned with doing what he is that God wants him to do or what he is that the people want him to do. I'm reminded of what it says back in, I believe it's Galatians chapter 1. And in verse 10, Paul said to the Galatians, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Jesus Christ. And friends, that is true regardless of who the individual is. So every case that we come across where people are lowering biblical standards and we're tempted they come along and, and, and lower our standards in order to make them happy. Friends, every new case is a test of whether that preacher is going to fear God or fear man. 
The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Friends, you can be sure, as we're going to look at in a moment, you can be sure that when you are fearing something, that fear does not come from God, with the exception of a couple of things that we'll see in just a moment. That being said, as we're on this subject of fear and the fact that sometimes people, um, you know, change things and water down where they stand and their biblical standards because of the fear of men, let me say this. Fear does not come from God, yet all people struggle with fears. There are fears. Timothy had them. That's why Paul had to write to Timothy and tell Timothy, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But friends, not only did Timothy battle with fear, but we see that Paul had fears as well. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse 5, Paul writing to the church of Corinth says, For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. So we see here that fears are something that are a part of life. But at the same time, we must understand that fears do not come from God. You can be sure, friends, when fear comes your way, that it's not coming to you from God. The only fear that comes from God is the fear of God itself. And the fear of God will not bring you to the place that you lower biblical standards. It's the fear of God that helps you maintain biblical standards in a world where the standards around us are crumbling, not only in this world, but sadly in many New Testament churches today. And friends, the only fear that comes from God is the fear of God or the fear of singing against God. So when we come to the place that, you know, we're saying, well, I'm going to uphold this standard because I fear God, or we fear that we're not going to sing against, uh, that we're going to sing against him. That is the only fear that comes from God. Friends, in God, there is not only no fear that comes from him other than the fear of God or fear that we're going to sing against him, but in God, there is victory over fear. Oh, friends, I'm so grateful today that in Christ and because of Christ, that you and I can have victory over these things in our life, including victory over fear. Let me give you a couple of great promises before we move on that can help us overcome fear. And we need to move on to some other things because there's other things that we need to discuss on as to why Preachers lower standards. What are some of the threats that weaken discipline and biblical standards in our church today? First of all, fear of man or pressure from man. Psalm 138 and verse 3 says this, In the day when I cry, thou answerest me, and strengtheneth me with strength in my soul. Oh, friends, what a blessing that is. He says, listen, when you cry, when you're in the midst of hardships and difficulties, if we come to the right place with those hardships and those difficulties, we see here the promise that not only does he answer us, but friends, he strengthens us in our soul. That is, he enables us to do what it is that we ought to do before him. He is the one that gives us the victory over our fears. He is the one that enables us to walk in a way that's honoring and pleasing to the Lord. He is the one that enables us to uphold the standards that he has given to us in his holy word. Also, as we think about this business of victory over fear, let me remind you of the truth of 1 Corinthians, or 1 Peter rather, chapter 5, and in verse 7, it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Friends, that includes that care that comes into our life as a result of struggling with the fears of man. Oh, friends, these promises of God are not carnal weapons. These promises of God are not fleshly weapons, but these promises that God has given to us are mighty weapons that can give us the victory in life, not only over temptation, but the victory over to sin, but the temptation to water down the truth of God, the temptation to water down our standards. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, Verses 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see here that God can give us victory over this fear of man and over this persuade uh, the uh, pressure that we feel from man. But then also, 
sometimes one of the things that hinders people um, from maintaining biblical standards and, and lowering our standards a little bit is, is there can be a fear of being overbearing and unreasonable. I just want to take a minute to deal with this before we move on. A preacher needs to always examine himself to make sure that he is not being overbearing and unreasonable. You know, when we stop and we look at some of these things that we're standing for, we need to stop and ask ourselves, am I right in this? Is this biblical? Do I have a biblical balance when it comes to this? Or am I being overbearing? Am I being unreasonable? Have I crossed the line? Am I becoming pharisaical? And then at the same time, as we're stopping and asking ourselves, ever being overbearing and unreasonable, we need the wisdom of God in this, and we need a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God to guide us, because at the same time, when we have those thoughts, understand that the devil can falsely accuse a preacher of being overbearing or of being too hard on people when he is only preaching God's word and when he's only enforcing it as God has commanded. So yes, one can become overbearing, and yes, one can become unreasonable, but but friends, we need the wisdom of God to know where we are because Satan will accuse you of those things in your heart and in your mind, even when you are not being those things. But the fear of being overbearing and unreasonable has caused some to lower their biblical standard. But then also, friends, this idea of becoming weary and well-doing can cause one to lower their biblical standard. You see, sometimes preachers just get tired of fighting. Sometimes preachers just get tired of arguing with those who do not want to live according to biblical standards. And they get to the place where they relax things a little bit because they're weary, they're tired, they're worn out. Maybe they're even on the verge of burnout. And as a result of that, they lower their standard. They lower their guard because they're weary and well-doing. You know, twice we're told in the New Testament to be not weary in well-doing. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So there we have the exhortation from Scripture to be careful that we do not become weary in well-doing. And sometimes when we're in the service of the Lord, oh, friends, we can get tired in the work, but we should never get tired of the work. And we need to be careful that we do not get weary in well-doing in our walk with God. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 13 we find a second instance where he warns them against being weary in well-doing. Notice what it says here in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13. It says, But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You see, obviously, being weary in well-doing is a very real possibility. If it was not a real possibility, the Holy Spirit of God, by inspiration, would not have encouraged Paul twice to encourage people and to remind people that they need to be careful that they do not get weary in well-doing. Now, we're thinking about biblical standards right now, and biblical standards also means enforcing discipline. And friends, it's interesting that once when this idea of being weary and well-doing is stated, that it is in the context of church discipline. If you're still in Second Thessalonians rather chapter 3, let's just read verses 6 through 13. So we can see that. It says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we, we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we any man's brag for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them which are such we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing." Friends, this explains sometimes why preachers, if I can put it this way, get soft in their old age. 
They've been ministering for years. They've been serving for years. They've been pastoring for years. And they just got to the place that they're tired. They're weary and well-doing. Oh, friends, that's one of the reasons why. Let me just take a moment to side note this. That it is good when possible for men of various generations to work together in the ministry. What happens when you build a ministry team is this, that the young supply the energy and the zeal that is needed while the elderly supply the mature wisdom and that they are able to work together so that people do not get weary in well-doing. Friends, it's very sad that it is so rare that men can get along well enough to minister in sex teams that the older preachers have to be put out of the ministry to make room for the new preach, for the younger preachers. Friends, that's what I see today. Rather than the younger wanting to work with the older men and to learn from them, they get to the place where I don't know if they feel threatened by them or what it is, but they just shove the old pe the older guys out of ministry. And friends, how sad that is. There is such a wonderful supply of wisdom there that can be matched with your zeal, that can be matched with your energy. And then the other side of it is the older men in ministry tend to not want to share the authority with the younger men and the younger men don't want to help uh, the help that the older people can supply. Friends, listen to me. If you're a young person in ministry or a young person in the Lord, I want you to understand something. When you, re when you graduate from Bible college, you do not have all the answers. You are not the be-all and end-all. I've seen people come out of Bible school and think they know all the answers to all the problems of life. They get five years into ministry and they realize they don't even know the questions, let alone know the answers. Oh, friends, we ought to be able to work together. And the biblical pattern is that we work together. For example, in Scripture, you see Paul the aged and Timothy working together to this end. Paul even wrote his final epistle to Timothy when he was awaiting death, and they were still co-workers in the work of the Lord. And friends, that is the way that it ought to be. We all have a place. As long as God gives us the ability and God gives us the breath, he expects that we be involved in the service of the king. The fourth thing that sometimes causes people to lower their standards is this, the knowledge of their own failings. We know where we've been. We know when we failed the Lord. I like how sec uh, rather 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 38 puts it. This is this is where the rubber meets the road on why some people lower their standards. 1 Kings 8:38 says, "What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man and by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward the house. You see, that's the problem, friends. Sometimes people lower standards because they know the plagues of their own heart. They know where they have failed the Lord in the past. And, and, and thank God that because somebody has upheld biblical standards, that they acknowledge where they went wrong and that they confess that and they forsook it. And by God's grace, they overcome it. But yet at the same time, they know where they bang. And sometimes that can be at the place that it, that it motivates us in a wrong way because it causes us to lean toward lowering standards and not going with what the Word of God says simply because of our own failings. You see, every preacher that is honest with himself knows that he's not worthy to preach God's Word and that he's not worthy to lead churches. The Apostle Paul actually called himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1 and in verse 15 he says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Friends the preacher must remember that he is ministering before God and that he will give an account to God. Why should a preacher maintain biblical standards? Because of the fact friends that he's accountable to God. And not only that, he is God's representative. He is God's servant in this world. And because of that, he ought to be doing what it is that God wants him to do, not doing what it is that people want him to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. 
Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Friends, we're reminded there of the fact that someday the preacher is going to stand before God and that ought to be enough motivation for the preacher to say, I'm not going to water down the word of God. I'm not going to change my standards away from what God is saying his word. He is the commander in chief. He is the chief shepherd. And I'm just an under-shepherd, and I am accountable to him. And friends, the preacher must honor God by being faithful in the ministry, not for his own glory, but for the Lord's glory. And the truth of the matter is that the preacher must examine himself, and he must confess his sins and walk in the light of the Scriptures so that he himself does not become disqualified. This business of just standing and preaching, friends, does not make one immune from spiritual failure. It does not make one immune from being disqualified from the faith. Matter of fact, one of, or from ministry, one of Paul's greatest fears was that after he had preached to others and won others to Christ and established churches and all of the things that God allowed him to do, that he would do something stupid that would disqualify him from ministry. But he talked about that in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He says, But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Friends, another thing that can hinder and bring us to the place that we lower standards very simply is anxiety and impatience. You say, preacher, what do you mean anxiety and impatience brings him to the place that he would lower standard? Well, it's an easy thing for a preacher to become anxious in light of a need. We've got this need. We've got this job that needs to be done. Who's going to do it? We don't have someone that can do it. And it's easy to get anxious in light of a need, and not wait for God's supply, not wait for God's timing. Friends, the exact same thing that a preacher preaches to other people, he must apply to himself when it comes to God's Word and when it comes to the ministry and the New Testament church that God has called him to. The preacher must put God first, and the preacher must honor the Word of God and wait for God to supply the need. Wait for God to fill that position that needs to be filled. As we've already said, it's better to have one person that's qualified than to have a dozen that are involved in ministry but are not qualified. God has promised to supply every need. Now, we look at that in the physical realm, but friends, it's also true when it comes to workers. God has promised to supply every need, but the catch is we must seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Friends, this is not my principle. This is God's principle. We must stand on God's word. We must maintain the standards that he has. And we must wait on him to move in the way that he desires to move. God will test your faith. God tested Abraham, did he not? Tested the faith of Abraham with the promised son. And we know that Abraham failed in that, that Abraham and Sarah became anxious. And rather than waiting on God's timing, they, they worked in the flesh. And we see the consequences are still with us today from the descendants of Ishmael. Friends, as we come to a conclusion, we've looked at five things. So we, we, in this, we've looked at five things that cause people to lower standards, which are wrong, or things that we need to watch for so that standards are maintained according to the Word of God and that they are not compromised upon. But let me say this today in what time we have left. This matter of maintaining Bible standards, this issue of standards, is an, I look at it as an issue of faith like everything else in the Christian life. As I've already said, God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Friends, we teach people to put God first. We teach people to be faithful to services, and God will take care of them. We teach people to tithe, and when they do, God will take care of them. Well, friends, likewise, I believe that as a preacher, I must honor the Lord's standards for baptism, for, for, for church membership, and for workers, and wait on God to provide what is needed. But when we put him first, he is going to provide what is needed. So first of all, 
this idea of maintaining standards and not lowering them for the sake of getting workers or things of that nature is a matter of faith. But secondly, it's about pursuing uh, excellence. We want to be the best that we can be for God. While I'm on the subject of standards for workers, friends, we should mention the importance of pursuing excellence in the work of God. I mentioned already that on the front wall of Chicago and Baptist Church in Nova Scotia, it says serving God with excellence in an excellent service, uh, excellent spirit. Friends, that ought to be our mentality. That needs to be our mentality as a people of God. We're soldiers. And a good soldier does not want to be a half-hearted soldier, a compromising soldier. A good soldier wants to be the absolute best soldier that they can be. And that ought to be our desire. And also, friends, we're priests. You can see that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. You can see in Revelation 1 and verse 6. Revelation 5 and verse 10 teaches the priesthood of the believer. And friends, the priests wanted to be the absolute best that they could be. For God. Beyond that, today, the church is an outpost of Christ's kingdom. And friends, we're here to do the will of the Master. We're here to do the will of our King. Now, in order to maintain these biblical standards, here, here's where we need to be. There has to be, in every church, if we're going to have strong biblical standards, there must be continual training. Not only on what God expects of us as believers, but there needs to be continual training for every ministry that we have in order to maintain these standards, whether it's ushering, whether it's song leading, whether it's public praying, whether it's Sunday school teaching, whether it's preaching, whatever it is, we need to continually be equipping people for the work of the ministry and maintaining the standards that God has given to us. Let's pray. Father our God, we thank you today for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would help us to maintain the biblical standards that your word proclaims, that we would not water down these standards. Lord, many churches, probably a lot of us can even think of instances where that has happened. And as a result, those churches have compromised and have sold out. Lord, help us to maintain our biblical integrity, our biblical stand and our biblical standards in, these day and, in this day and age by your grace. Help us, Lord, in our churches to be all that we can be for you. In your name we pray. Amen.